Hi, welcome back. It's time for the Q&A session. A little bit delayed because as you can see, I just took a shower and now my hair is going 20 different directions. Um, what I'm going to do, about all the questions ended up in uh, Facebook on the event. Nobody uh, at this point has said anything in Twitter, at least that I have seen. I'll probably check it here before the end. But what I'll do is I'll go through the comments in the event, uh, on the event page, and just kind of take them from first to last. Uh, and then at three o'clock, I'll announce all the prizes and say farewell and tell you all thank you. Uh, so let's begin. First question is from Jen Nixon, um, who already knows this because we've like kvetched about this over and over and over again. Uh, but Jen Nixon is making me confess. When did I first start writing? What was the genre of the first book you finished? Uh, if you don't count a fanfic thing, the first book I finished was North Coast Shakedown under the name Jim Winter. Uh, back in 2005, it got published. And uh, that was a detective novel. But when did I start writing? I started writing when I was a teenager. And I couldn't really figure out what I wanted to write, um, which is typical of being a teenager. You basically want to imitate what you see. And so I imitated Star Trek. I imitated James Bond. I imitated Star Wars. Um, tried to write a hospital thing once, and I think I got as far as writing out the characters. And I'm like, well, this would be a great series Bible, but it doesn't really do anything. So uh, anyway, uh, so yeah, I uh, spent the 90s trying very hard to convince myself I was going to be a science fiction writer and I basically wrote a bunch of Star Trek fanfic and yeah we all have to cop to that I'm sorry we do uh, if you're not copying to that I'm going to call you a liar um, but uh, journalists can get away with that because normally they don't do that uh, let's take a look here and next question comes from Juanita Lynn I am not surprised that Juanita has asked this because Juanita met me 13 years ago during my aborted stand-up career and has seen the madness over the years that goes with being an author. Uh, how long did it take you to complete this book? Uh, the first draft, which was a screenplay, I think I talked about that earlier, uh, was done uh, spring of last year. I think I started in March and uh, 2019. I think that took about two months to write. Um, that was part of the reason I wanted to do it as a screenplay was I wanted an outline, but I wanted a fully formed story. Um, and then I went back and did a rewrite and that took about two months, which was easy to do because I was taking a screenplay and just converting it to prose. Not as easy as I thought. For starters, uh, montage scenes do not translate well into prose. Um, and then I piddled around with the points of view and adding things in and taking them out and the thing went from 60,000 to 85,000 to 140,000 down to 101,000. And I think it's at 98,000 now. There's six drafts uh, from March of 2019 to uh, July of 2020. And yes, the, uh, the lockdown did help quite a bit, uh, which is good because my beta has just absolutely savaged it. Uh, one guy went... Marines, you wrote a mill sci-fi finale to your series, and there are no Marines, there are no space battles. What in the hell is your problem, Hoddle? So, so Sergeant Rock went in and kicked Gelt ass as he incin as his flamethrower incinerated the Gelt warrior. He took a sniff and said. I love the smell of burnt alien in the morning. Great. Now I got to put that scene in the newsletter as a deleted item. So anyway, uh, thanks Juanita. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, Scott McGlasson, uh, one of the denizens of the space opera group used to be one of the admins and, uh, kind of is an elder statesman now asks, describe what you like to wear when writing the intimate scenes. Okay. I'll show you. There you go. Jeans and a t-shirt, which is pretty much what I have been wearing since uh, COVID-19 arrived on our fair shores and kind of messed life up for everybody in these United States, not to mention everywhere else. So, um, and prior to that, it was, uh, 
polo shirt and jeans. I've worn jeans to work for about five years. I think I maybe have worn a polo shirt three times in the last uh, six months. And uh, I think I've worn khakis once. In fact, I think I've got, I think before that I went like 18 months without wearing khakis. I don't wear khakis. If I got another job, I'd have to wear khakis. But anyway, uh, I pretty much wear the same thing whenever I'm writing. I have sat and written in a ratty t-shirt and a pair of shorts that I wear to bed. And that's usually like first thing in the morning when I get up. Uh, lately, especially since I do more dictation now. Uh, especially, um, right now I do food delivery, uh, definitely did not do that when I was doing, uh, ride share, uh, just cause passengers find it a little alarming when you're sitting there speaking to Google docs, talking about aliens and, and, and the way the gelt have sex and, um, you know, wormholes and shock pistols and things like that. It's just, uh, that's not part of their normal day. Um, you know, especially since the passengers, some of the passengers would like you to pay attention to them. I don't blame them. I mean, I'm paying somebody to drive me around, uh, and I'm feeling conversational. I want them to talk to me. Usually I don't like to talk to the driver, although we end up swapping more stores, but Uber is in my rear view mirror. Uh, don't know if it's coming back anytime soon. Uh, so what else does Mr. Scott have to say? Uh, that's amazing. I've actually been managing most of this on my phone. Uh, he also asked if I'm a pantser or a plotter. Uh, these days I am a plotter. Um, I like knowing where the stories are going ahead of time before I actually finish it out. Um, now some people say, well, I felt like I've already told the story. Uh, I am of the school of thought that says that's a thin first draft. Um, and to be honest with you, most of the scenes that I sketch out don't end up turning out the way I expect them to. Uh, outlining is usually just writing like a summary. In my case, it's writing a summary. Sometimes I'll do like a full chapter outline. You know, chapter one, this happens, this happens, this happens. Uh, but when you get into the meat of it, the scene will take a left turn. Because then all of a sudden, now the characters are involved. Uh, whereas before, you're kind of giving them stage direction. And so in that way, I have become a plotter. I used to be a pantser, and in fact, most of the stuff I used to write was uh, pantsed. Uh, Scott had one more question. What is the central technological conceit? Humans in 500 years will not be nearly as advanced as they think they will. Uh, now, on the one hand, we have rejuvenation, and we have a type of rejuvenation that you only do once, but most of it is... Uh, a concept that uh, they touched on in uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars series where you shorten the telomeres and suddenly your body clock is taken back to 10 years old. And, uh, you know, there are some damn fine, sexy 80-year-olds with white hair and gorgeous bodies, you know. Like all the women look like Hel Helen Mirren. Um, and that that's... Uh, so that's, that's on the upside. We have wormholes and there's a dedicated network and, you know, um, it's like a cross between, um, it's like a cross between the old Stargates on, uh, Buck Rogers or the hyper, uh, the jump gates in, uh, Babylon five as well. And, uh, the age of sale, because there's no FTL, the signals actually, Messages are sent back and forth on ships between hypergates, or the hypergates themselves will relay messages back and forth. But it's very difficult to communicate across stellar distances in real time. Uh, hopefully by the end of this next phase of the series, that will be rectified. Uh, but that's going to introduce some wrinkles of its own. Um, the other thing is AI. AI is everywhere, but AI is mostly nice and stupid. There are like six AIs that could be considered people at this point. Uh, so you find out that they're very, they're very rare. Uh, next question. There were Abergon Gusick, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. I, I, I've seen you on two different groups for years and I'm not pronouncing your name properly. So I hope I'm not pronounced mispronouncing your name, but uh, I'm going to go with Abergon Gusick. 
Uh, he asked about main characters, and he asked that before I posted the videos about JT and Davra, about uh, Cray, Lightman, and Farad, and about uh, Suicide in Japan. Uh, so those are the biggies. I think I touched on all of them, and I gave enough lip service to the other ones to give you an idea of what's going on. He had uh, two other questions, uh, but they come from RPG, and I do not know much about RPG. I just really don't have enough knowledge about it to answer that. Um, unfortunately, they didn't punch that. You know, they didn't punch that particular hole on my uh, on my nerd card. I I I, I you know. It's a shortcoming. <laughs> uh, but he did ask me, um, could I describe Amargosa? Yes, actually, I can. Amargosa is a very Earth-like world. It has a fairly large satellite. Um, and it is a colony of Mars. Um, it shares a system with um, two interesting worlds. There's a distant rocky world at the edge of the star system uh kind of a neptune pluto kind of thing and i cannot for the life of me pronounce the name without having it in front of me which is hard to do with the video right now uh hopefully on the next event i'll have something set up i might even be able to do Streamyard. um but it, it actually came from a beavis and butthead episode when they went to a monster truck show and somebody jumped a bunch of porta johns and came down on the Porta Johns instead of hitting the ramp. And uh, this big giant cloud with fangs comes out and goes, You have desecrated my temp temple. And Butthead looks up and goes, It's, and I cannot think of the Roman god's name, but he goes, The Roman god of feces. And I went, Yeah, I'm going to do it. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, I was originally going to name it for a small town in Oklahoma. And I went, yeah, that's a little more fitting for uh, Amargosa. Amargosa itself, um, as a colony, only one continent is inhabited, but it had a big enough population um, at the very beginning of the Children of Amargosa and in the novella Gimme Shelter that it could have been a core world. You know, those are the big main worlds. They have their own colonies. They have representation in the compact assembly and so on. And um, the vegetation is kind of reddish. Uh, there are five major cities, the largest of which was Landstorp before it was nuked. It had one million people in it. Uh, most of those fled. Uh, and another one called Arcanum, which had about three quarters of a million. There is an industrial city near the North Pole called Deming. And their North Pole has a continent, whereas most other planets have basically just a big ice pack. Of course, we have Antarctica at the South Pole, so make of that what you will. Um, there is another town on one of the coasts called Riverside, and that plays a major role in storming Amargosa. And then there's one that's kind of forgotten called Suskin. It's a scientific outpost near the equator, but it's so far up in the central Alps that it snows in summer. So that's it's it's a very chilly place to live, and you would think that being in a tropical climate like that. But then again, it snows in, in, in Hawaii. So uh, so that is uh, Abergon's uh, question. Let's see. Do we have anything else? Hold on here. Uh, we do not, uh, other than the fact that, uh, Jen Nixon loves my villains. Well, you know what? I like them too. I especially loved giving Lucius Gray the fate he so richly deserved. <laughs> anyway, spoiler alert. <laughs> okay. Uh, check back in around three o'clock and I will have for you who won the prizes and some final thoughts like Jerry Springer. Well, hopefully not like Jerry Springer. Why is he still on the air? And uh, that'll be it. I will see you then.